Welcome, Your Excellencies. I recognise the ambassadors of Peru and Venezuela, other members of diplomatic missions to Australia, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker from Macquarie University, Associate Professor Morris Morley. Morris has a long and distinguished academic career writing about Latin America with a particular focus on US policy in Latin America. Indeed, in relation to the Chilean coup in 1973, he published his first book on this question in 1975, published in the United States and then in Mexico. And since then, I think he's on perhaps the eighth book uh, is about to be published, which is also about Chile and in particular about Reagan's policy uh, in Chile at the time. So he has a wealth of knowledge to bring to this, but let me say a few moment, for a few moments, if I could, uh, something about the topic itself, about the coup in Chile in 1973. Uh, as you might realise, I was only a small boy at the time, uh, a schoolboy, but uh, even as a schoolboy, a reasonably politically aware schoolboy, I was certainly aware that the coup had taken place on the 11th of September in 1973 because it sent shockwaves, had reverberations throughout the world for many reasons, I think. One was it meant for many people, particularly on the left of politics, what seemed to be really an end for one kind of progressive politics, a closing of the road for that kind of progressive politics. It had reverberations in Europe, for example, on the various uh, left movements of Europe and their visions of trying to transform society peacefully through a parliamentary road. It had, of course, massive ramifications in Latin America. It wasn't the first of the military coups of that period, of course. Uh, Brazil in 1964 and others before that preceded it. But it seemed to, be, to play a very important part, I think, in what happened in Latin America in subsequent years. And in the following years, of course, very few countries in Latin America, I think only two for one period, were not under some kind of military regime. So Chile stands into, in, that, uh, in that important part of history in all of those ways. And of course, it has great importance for the people who lived there at the time, uh, for the victims, the many thousands of people who were arrested, who were tortured and executed by the regime. It was a long running dictatorial regime lasting until 1990, of course. And it has important for us as I look around the room as well in another way, in that following 1973, of course, Australia established another kind of connection with Chile, which is that we received many of the people who were fleeing that regime, including, of course, a future president of Chile. After the, the talk, and Morris will talk for about 40 minutes or so, there'll be ample opportunity for questions and discussion for about another 20 minutes. Uh, and then we've provided drinks and refreshments. And most important, we've provided the music of Victor Hara, one of the great heroes of the period, the uh, leader, the most prominent member of the Nueva Cancion movement, the new song movement that was so much associated with progressive change in Chile at that point, who lost his life, of course, in the immediate aftermath of the coup. And we are fortunate to have also, who's come from Sydney to sing for us today, Jorge Bontes, who is a, a fine exponent of the music of Victor Hara, who will do a very brief introduction about Victor Hara and his place two in two pages. <laughs> a fairly brief introduction uh, on the life of Victor Hara. And then we'll perform the music of Victor Hara while we're, he's happy to do that, while we're drinking our wine and having our refreshments and so on. So without further ado, please welcome Associate Professor Morris Morley. Okay, thank you, John. Um, 
Well, I guess John has sort of made the obvious point that what happened in Chile between, well, well both between 1970 and 1973 and on September 11, 1973, were really world historic events and were certainly historic events in terms of uh, 20th century Latin American history. Now, what I want to do today, tonight essentially is to um, address the question of why did the Chilean experiment with democratic socialism last a mere three years? And what role did the Nixon administration play in the demise of that experiment? Or to put it another way, what was the relationship between American policy and political developments inside Chile? Because without looking at that connection, it's really impossible, I think, to understand why this coup happened. Now, before I get into the sort of nitty gritty of the discussion, a couple of kind of um, context observations. One sort of introductory, one historical, and one regional. Now, prior to 1973, Chile was one of the few countries in Latin America that had a stable political institutions and a multi-party bargaining system. And what held that system together was a very cohesive capitalist class in mining, in agriculture, and in industry. And this class had interlocking economic and kinship ties. It's a class that debated issues, that shaped policies, that allowed change, that um, closed ranks in the face of outside challenges. And it was precisely the absence of any major challenge to the distribution of wealth and power in Chile that allowed this political and social system, Chilean democracy, to flourish in the way that it did. Now, in other words, you had a capitalist class in Chile that could be tolerant, could allow reforms to be implemented, um, even under middle class governments, precisely because its own power was never seriously threatened, either internally or externally, until 1970. The Allende election victory, that is the coalition of the socialist and communist parties with Mapu and the Mir and a few others, was really a watershed event in Chilean history because, well not least because it in a sense shattered the democratic tradition myth of Chilean politics. By that I mean the hostile and the destabilizing response of the Chilean upper class and their right wing political allies over the following uh, three years um, really uh, revealed the elite character of Chile's institutions, uh, the extent to which they were class dominated, and also the political rights willingness to destroy parliamentary democracy if that was what was necessary in order to restore, reinstitute the economic power of the dominant groups in pre-Allende Chilean society. Now, let me sort of say something about the regional context. By the end of the 1960s, the multi-million dollar US aid program for Latin America, the Alliance for Progress, had basically failed to satisfy popular expectations. In other words, expectations of social and economic change. And it triggered, ultimately, a new cycle of nationalist unrest, a new a resurgence of nationalism. And this resurgence was accompanied by a very distinct anti-foreign capital, anti-US tinge to it. Political and also military forces advocating greater national control over economic resources and intent on either transforming or redefining relations with the United States. Um, in not just in Chile, but in Bolivia, in Peru, uh, emerge, as well as some quite formidable nationalist movements in countries like, uh, like Uruguay and Argentina. Now, Allende's Chile represented the focal point of this new nationalist challenge. It was the linchpin. Its efforts to move Chile out of the capitalist orbit, uh, its support for ideological pluralism, <coughs> weakens the ties between North and South. Uh, it really posed a very direct challenge to the ability of Washington to, in a sense, maintain to secure the continent both politically and economically in terms of American interests. 
and to Nixon and Kissinger, his Secretary of State, um, the Chilean election, they saw it as, they, they loved to use medical metaphors. It was a cancer, it was a poison. Um, and it had to be eliminated or else it might spread uncontrollably right through the regional body politic. Mm -hmm. And so what follows, or what followed from that, was a White House decision to try and mobilise all of the resources that it had its at its command to try and topple this elected government from power. Now, it's important, I think, to understand what Washington was all about, what it wanted to do. After uh, one very senior State Department official had just returned from um, leave, a matter of days after the election, and he came to the White House and he said he encountered a White House that, and these are his words, had literally gone ape, that they were um, frantic, that they were just beside themselves, he said. Um, and this was the, uh, just preceded the famous meeting between Richard Nixon, uh, Richard Helms, the CIA director, and Kissinger, at which Nixon told Helms to try and prevent Allende from being inaugurated, stop him from coming to power, and you know, unseat him by whatever means possible. Uh, didn't matter about the risks, make the economy scream, these famous statements from Nixon. And Helms later recalled that he tried to tell Nixon that no agency official believed that it was possible to prevent Allende from being inaugurated. And Helms said it was like talking into a gale. Now, if Nixon was beside himself over this election outcome and took out his frustration on Helms, Kissinger was just as apoplectic. And he, he took out his frustration on the State Department. He accused them of simply not you know, taking their eye off the ball, dismissing the possibility that Allende could have won that election. And he conjured up the spectre of these kind of dire global and regional kind of implications for the United States uh, um, of if, if this vote was allowed to stand. You know, he talked about that, you know, this might affect, you know, communist parties coming to power through the ballot box in Europe, in Italy in, in particular. And he also declared that what was happening in Chile had the potential to undermine the American position throughout the Western Hemisphere. And of course, he didn't exclude the Chilean electorate itself. Remember his famous statement. He accused them of behaving irresponsibly by voting this, this government into power. They brought Chilean democracy into disrepute. Now, okay, nonetheless, Nixon was determined. And to prevent Allende from being inaugurated, Washington implemented a two-track strategy. Track one was a kind of political, economic and propaganda program. And this was designed to try and induce the opposition political parties to block a formal transfer of power. Track two was about trying to see if, if it was possible to foment a military coup. Now, at the same time as that was happening, Kissinger was chairing a series of interagency committees um, to devise a program of economic sanctions in the event that Allende was inaugurated. Now, Washington failed to get the Chilean Congress to uh, vote against Allende's election <coughs> confirmation, and there was, you know, a military coup. As if the circumstances simply was not, were not propitious for a military coup to to, to uh, happen. But none of this dissuaded Nixon and Kissinger. In fact they simply decided to redouble their efforts um, to try and bring about uh, um, you know, the demise of this government before its six-year term in office ended. Now, what's important, I think, to note here um, is that American policy was not determined by any particular decision taken by the Allende government. It, was, it derived much more from a commitment to oppose structural ideological developments. That is to say, the nationalisation of American properties was not the primary issue, to take one example. What policymakers in Washington refused to countenance was the nationalization of American economic interests in a country where nationalization was linked to a socialist, anti-capitalist development strategy. Now, here we come to the core of 
the American approach. Days after the inauguration of Allende, Nixon and his national security team meet in the, cabinet, uh, meet in the White House. And they meet specifically to discuss the problem of Chile. And one of the senior State Department officials basically sets the tone for the meeting with his opening comment. And what he says was this. He said, the problem is how to bring about Allende's downfall. And then he continued by saying, this can only be achieved in collaboration with internal forces who are opposed to this regime, given the limits on our capacity, our capability to do it alone. So in other words, from the very beginning, there's a very clear recognition that getting rid of this government could only be achieved um, if the US was able to mobilise significant political, social or class forces inside Chile who were willing to collaborate um, in toppling this government. And therefore, and there, the, the, this, this is why you get this decision to pursue what we might describe as an outsider and an insider strategy. Uh, and both are kind of interrelated. Because ultimately, the goal of, the, of Washington was to create a requisite level of political and economic chaos in Chile that would induce the military to intervene and solve their problem. Now, let's look at the outsider strategy. The outsider strategy was based on Chile's economic vulnerability. That is, its economic vulnerability to US pressure. And this provided a natural target for the Nixon administration. I mean, Washington's ability to, to make the economy scream, as Nixon put it, was enormously facilitated by a couple of factors. The copper industry, which accounted for approximately 90% of the country's foreign exchange earnings and was uh, largely controlled at that point by American corporations, and the fact of Chile's extensive dependence on funding from both US public and private sources and from the US-influenced international development banks, both global and regional. Now, and this funding was both for, not, not just for long-term development projects, but for the day-to-day -day operations of the Chilean economy. So following Allende's inauguration, the US government systematically goes for the economic jugular. First of all, it terminates all bilateral aid, not military aid, but economic aid. And that was significant because on a per capita basis, Chile had been the largest recipient of Alliance for Progress funds. Second, it imposed a spare parts embargo. And that had a very devastating effect on a country whose agricultural and industrial infrastructure was dependent, overwhelmingly dependent on purchases of materials from American firms. And of course, that had a huge impact on the copper industry and on production levels and foreign exchange earnings. Third, the Nixon policy um, resulted in a precipitous decline in short-term commercial credits, which also affected the government's ability to purchase um, replacement parts and machinery for critical economic sectors. Fourth, the White House sought to limit Chile's access to um, capitalist bloc export markets, most notably a partially successful effort to place an embargo on Chilean uh, exports to Western Europe. And finally, it was enormously successful in mobilising support within the major regional and international development banks to virtually cut off all loans, all aid to Chile from those sources. And, and that was important because prior to 1970, Chile had been a major recipient of loans from those sources. Now, in a porous kind of dependent society like Chile's, these mutually reinforcing economic sanctions were a kind of formidable instrument in shifting the whole balance, internal balance of power against the government. And over time, the Nixon administration was able to identify gradual economic deterioration, not with US policy, but with internal government policy and thereby creating the basis 
for polarising Chilean society in a manner that was favourable to uh, the large property-owning groups and the anti-left political forces in Chile. Now, you might ask, well, why, why could not Chile find alternative sources of income support? Well, very good reason for that. The economic sanctions, the US economic sanctions, placed Chile in such a serious bind simply because they couldn't find sufficient alternative sources of financing or trade to offset these losses. There was little or no support coming from Western Europe. And more interestingly, the Soviet bloc, the Soviet Union, refused to provide any significant substantial aid for a couple of reasons. One was their concern that, the, that um, the government might not survive its term in office because of American policy. But the second one was just as interesting, which was this was the high point of superpower detente. And superpower detente between the Soviets and the Americans was based partly on a recognition by each of the superpowers of their own sphere of influence. So what that meant was that the last thing Moscow wanted to do was to become embroiled in a major dispute with Washington uh, you know, within Washington's traditional historic sphere, um, and especially over, you know, over Chile. And so the upshot of all of this was that again they could not, at one and the same time, honour past external financial obligations, meet current economic pressures, and pursue a coherent and effective development policy. Okay, now, let's look at the insider strategy before we see how the two are connected. Now, the efforts to, realize, to sort of realise sort of economic dislocation and, um, inside Chile was paralleled by a deepening of ties between the United States and critical sectors of the Chilean state and civil society. And the objective here was to sort of weaken the capacity of the state in particular to realise this national, nationalist development project. Now... And, and to enlist um, those forces inside Chile that might be receptive to supporting US policy objectives. Now, to maximise these efforts, the Nixon administration, unlike Eisenhower with Cuba a decade earlier, made a very conscious decision. It was not going to rupture diplomatic ties. It was not going to pull its embassy out. And that, because, and that enabled it, over time, to collect information, to support the political opposition, to mount a devastatingly effective covert action program, and to facilitate the flow of financial resources to the major domestic groups that were sympathetic to its strategy. Now, the circumstances of Allende's accession to power promised to create some very formidable institutional constraints on the new government's efforts to pursue and undertake its social and economic programs. What must never be lost sight of here, it seems to me, is that the UP, Unidad Popular, achieved office in a context of divided political power. It controlled the, only the executive branch of government. Congress remained under opposition control, an opposition stronghold throughout the entire three years, and was responsible for blocking all manner of key legislation, government legislation. The judiciary remained an opposition stronghold throughout the Allende presidency. The bureaucracy, in return for Christian Democratic Party votes to, um, to ratify the election, Allende guaranteed that those officials who staffed the bureaucracy um, in previous governments would retain their positions, except for the person at the very top, the minister. And what that effectively meant was that the opposition had allies inside the government who were in a position to slow down or even sabotage uh, the implementation of government programs. Likewise, the pre-election guarantees also extended to the mass media. Now, the mass media, where the political opposition had a decisive advantage in terms of, of ownership and control, 
that, you know, that ownership of control does not fundamentally change through the whole e period of the Allende's rule. And finally, the majority of the armed forces' leadership. They had long-standing personal and professional ties with their Pentagon counterparts, and that had played quite an important role, among other things, in influencing their own political outlooks. So in other words, the elite character of the country's uh, institutions creates a very propitious kind of environment within which Washington could operate, the operational environment, to, in order to, to obstruct the efforts by the government to transform Chile into a sort of democratic socialist sort of society. And, uh, and this was particularly so in light of the fact that Washington had these close ties with most of the prominent right-wing and centrist political and institutional forces in Chilean society, that Washington had had a history right through the 1960s of electoral intervention on their side, and of course you had the dominating presence of American capital in some of the most critical sectors of Chile's uh, economy. Now, the UP government was able to implement a significant part of its social and economic, of its structural social and economic program, despite these constraints, through a very judicious and effective use of the existing legal and bureaucratic machinery that is that was already in place, laws that were already on the books that had come in under fray but hadn't been enforced. However, by the latter half of 1971, the internal opposition is now beginning to recover from the disarray of the post-election period. And they're now beginning to sort of develop a strategy to contest the government and its program. And at the same time, the external sanctions are slowly beginning to feed into an, a set of interrelated problems that are now beginning, just beginning to confront the UP government. Rising inflation, you know, rising import costs, good shortages, declining investment, um, the growth of the black market, falls in the price and production of copper. These economic problems now begin to generate uh, diff uh, what we might call political ideological differences within the government itself. Differences over the tactics and the strategy for achieving its objectives. You know, how do we proceed in the, in the context of what's now happening? So there were disagreements over a range of issues. Um, relations with the middle class, uh, relations with the Christian Democrats, um, support for mass mobilisation politics, attitudes towards the Soviet Union, um, these unauthorised factory and land occupations, you know, pressure from below. And more broadly speaking, the whole, the, the pace and the scope of economic change. So you're beginning to get a lot of sort of debate and disagreement and even conflict within the government by the, by the, by the latter part of 1971. And these divergent positions were not easily reconciled. And so, as a result, you get big delays in the submission of critical legislation, particularly legislation to take over the commanding heights of the economy. And, um, and they hampered the government in all kinds of ways, uh, affecting its ability to implement a kind of coherent policy program. And of course, these intra, you know, government sort of disagreements did little to strengthen the um, the government's ability to withstand what were now becoming, uh, you know, more and more significant sort of uh, challenges from an increasingly united opposition. Now, by early 1972, the most prominent um, anti-government forces in civil society had regrouped. They're beginning to develop a focused and organised counter-response to... Um, to the government. And um, in particular, they begin to take advantage of the Allende's uh, uh, attempts to socialise the economy were very gradual. I mean, it was a very gradualist kind of approach to economic transformation, especially when it came to the in critical industrial and commercial sectors of the economy, and I'll pick up on that in a moment. But at this point, um, 
ranged against the coalition. You have a whole set of uh, you know, um, uh, opponents. You've got the large landowners and industrialists. You've got the propertied lower middle class. You've got the whole the, the retail and um, wholesale merchants who were opposed to the government's efforts to, to um, what assume direct control over distribution of goods to try and sort of uh, preempt the black market. You had peasants that wanted to own their own private plots of land uh, and not work on state farms or collectives. Um, and of course, you had the major political parties of the centre and the right, the National Party and the Christian Democrats. And they now begin to put their own differences aside in order to jointly oppose the government. Now, to get back to the, I mentioned the industrial and commercial sectors of the economy. Now, although there were selective nationalisations in these two sectors, they both still largely remained <coughs> under capitalist control. And it was precisely in those two sectors that the government confronted its most serious kinds of economic problems. I mean, industrialists stopped investing. Um, they, cut, they cut back on production. They funneled money into private banks. Uh, in the commercial sector, you began to get an enormous amount of hoarding of goods, of um, selling goods on the black market to sort of circumvent uh, price controls and so forth. Now, while that was going on during 1972, the government's initial agricultural reforms are just beginning to produce results. And what happened? The thousands of small truck owners who were responsible for moving goods and foodstuffs from the production centres to the uh, markets and the resale outlets embark on a series of strikes. And this had a devastating impact, particularly on the government's social base because the cumulative impact of what these, uh, these uh, you know, happens, you know, of, of this development was good shortages, rising prices, skyrocketing inflation and economic stagnation. And it was the scarcities that become the big political problem for the government. Why? Because the government's initial income redistribution had, you know, unleashed consumer demand and, and the expectations, particularly amongst its own social base, all of a sudden, they can't be satisfied. Now, the political opposition sought to, um, to give effect, uh, to, to these, uh, uh, sought to um, create a very uh, uh, disciplined kind of approach in challenging the government through very specific organisational structures that had very close ties to the centre and the right-wing political parties, and these were the so-called gremios. Now, these were confederations, associations. There were gremios of large landowners, large industrialists, small property owners, small industrialists, uh, salaried professionals, and so on. And because all of these groups uh, felt threatened by the government's policies, the large property owners, in particular, were able to promote a kind of a sense of identity by playing on this theme of a common ownership of property versus this sort of propertyless working class who were posing this sort of serious threat. Okay. And the um, and 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 you know this 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 threat from below was very important, I think, because it really served to heighten the sense of, particularly amongst the sort of lower, the small property owning class, this very numerous class, that sense of being embattled in a very hostile and sort of threatening kind of world. All right, now, what's happening in Washington at, while all this is going on? Well, the Nixon administration is not sort of, uh, um, uh, you, know, it's, you know, paying attention elsewhere. It's, it's watching. It's very carefully monitoring what's happening in Chile. Um, and it's now beginning to devote more and more time, more and more dollars, in terms of dealing with this problem. And to complement and to reinforce this growing internal opposition, and to take advantage of the kind of 
economic external uh, pressures that are beginning to really bite, it now, uh, and that are beginning to, to kind of create major dislocations in the Chilean economy, the White, it's at this point that the White House authorised a significant expansion of CIA covert activities. So that's the connection. So at this point, supported by the traditional elites, the CIA moves to, to mobilise and finance those social forces that have been most adversely affected by the deteriorating economic conditions and to direct their political energies against the government. And it's that a principal target of this effort was this property-owning lower middle class, which were not only very numerous, but they were concentrated in the capital city of Santiago, which was you know, the nerve centre of the government. Now, why they concentrate on this particular class? This is an interesting class, um, very contradictory in their attitudes towards politics and the state. Um, in fact, initially, a lot of these individuals, in fact, were quite sympathetic towards the UP government. Why? Well, they benefited directly from government policy. You know, increased access to state credits, rising sales in their, in their shops and so on because, you know, wage increases for the workers. Or, you know, uh, uh, increased spending by uh, upper class had become very fearful of what was going on. But now, as Washington's economic blockade begins to bite, all of a sudden the lines of credit dry up. Spare parts become harder to obtain. And you've got this, uh, the government's working class supporters um, becoming more and more militant, demanding a quickened pace of social and economic change, organising street rallies on an almost daily basis. Now, this was a class that abhorred sort of instability and um, disorder. And for them, the world is now becoming more and more hostile, more and more kind of threatening. And so they're, in turn, becoming more receptive to these kinds of traditional right-wing appeals to, um, we need to restore order. We need to defend the sanctity of private property, the family, the religion, and to reverse this kind of trend towards economic anarchy. So the result of this is they become available for mobilisation, you know, by the traditional elites, uh, the agency, and uh, their ability to channel their resentments in a political direction. Now, the right-wing political parties and the gremios, they begin developing a coordinated strategy during the middle of 1972 around a series of strikes that they hoped would eventually weaken and oust the UP government from power, either by forcing Allende to resign or by getting the armed forces to intervene. Now, in October of 1972, any doubts about the class nature of this conflict is swept away. The Truck Owners Confederation, the Gremio, okay, goes on strike ostensibly for a specific um, okay, economic grievance. It has a grievance of the government. Within 48 hours, this strike has ballooned into the first general strike of the capitalist class as a whole. Okay? And it was in part funded by the CIA. Okay? The entire gremialista movement dissipates, the factories are closed, uh, shops are closed, uh, the strikes endorsed by the National Party and the Christian Democrats. And so what begins here as a strike by a single gremio becomes a strike, an effort to paralyse the economy and then gets transformed into a political strike to get rid of the government. Now, even though the political opposition uh, fails, um, it had a devastating economic impact in terms of economic losses. Now, over the next, you know, eight or nine months, next year, let's say, the CIA subsidised a whole series of very devastating strikes against the government in the agricultural, industrial and mining sectors. They financed a number of big political strikes by the Gremialista movement, all of which served as a basis for huge losses, production losses, foreign exchange losses and so on. Now, and, and it's interesting, at this point, there were about a thousand of these gremios. 
actively opposing the government. And so it's little wonder that the CIA at this point uh, is pursuing its objective through these organisations because it now saw them as the real holders of power in Chile. Now the final aspect of this program, of this covert action program, was a very sustained uh, media assault, propaganda assault against the government in the newspapers, the radio stations and the television networks. Now this was important because this enabled the mass media to play a very key role in influencing popular consciousness by formulating uh, major issues, public issues, in a manner compatible with American policy objectives. So in other words, the negative effects of increasing US economic pressures and covert intervention were depicted in the media as a result of government policy, as a result of the breakdown of law and order, um, as a result of an undisciplined labor force. And so what this did was that it exacerbated the inevitable problems, errors, you know, miscalculations, that are going to accompany any process of large-scale social and economic change. And in the process, they created the appearance, at least the appearance, of very large-scale opposition to the government's policies. Now, this... Um, now, um, OK, now, the... Just to, um, I'll try and finish in a few minutes. The, the economic dislocation and the, and the covert sort of intervention were well, also paralleled by deepening ties between the United States and the Chilean armed forces, which had the effect, ultimately, of further separating what was, what was the key uh, in state institution from the national government and its development program. And as the preparations for the coup quickened, the CIA was very involved in uh, providing the military plotters with uh, support, direction, putting together lists of people to be arrested, uh, insta government installations to be taken over, and so forth and so on. Now, this combination of um, you know, major US intervention in the Chilean political process and a rising level of class conflict precipitates another big debate inside the, the government. And you can see over how to respond to all this and very sharp differences of opinion. On the one hand, the more conservative uh, approach was taken by Allende and the Communist Party. And, uh, they argued, look, to deal with this problem, these, these myriad problems, we've got to consolidate the process of change that we've undertaken. We've got to emphasise now the need to increase productivity and we've got to try and reach out to the middle, middle class. On the other hand, you had the left wing of the Socialist Party and the, Christian, the left wing Christian Democrats, the Mapu and uh, the Mir, the movement of the revolutionary left, they're saying, no, we've got to accelerate the process of change. We've got to target the industrial and commercial sectors. We've got to mobilise the working class. We've got to confront and uh, defeat this opposition. Well, neither strategy really develops, you know, um, that's a dominant one because it's all overtaken by events, which was the military coup. OK, just, uh, just to conclude. Um, now, the American efforts to destabilise and force Allende from power, very unlikely it could have succeeded in the absence of three factors. A permeable Chilean state and civil society. Secondly, Allende's commitment to maintaining an open bargaining democratic political system which the US and its internal allies exploited to, in a sense, you know, destroy it, to promote regime change. And finally, the incomplete nature of the UP government's social and economic transformation. And as um, John mentioned a little earlier, the coup itself had huge significance for Latin America. I mean, in the whole series, it was a huge defeat for the political left. It was a defeat for, you know, the whole experiment of parliamentary socialism. It was the beginning of this period of long, long period of military dictatorships. And also, Chile becomes the first, the laboratory for the experimental experiments, uh, or the first sort of neoliberal 
economic free market experiment in the third world. Um, okay, let's stop there. Okay. Why the need for a coup? Well, well, there, I mean, well, I mean, you know, objectively, there wasn't a need for a coup. I mean, look, the the, um, the problem was there was there was little hard evidence. I mean, I agree with you. Why the need for a coup? There was little hard evidence uh, to support, you know, one view, which was that the Chileans wanted Allende to be overthrown by force, rather than to be defeated at the ballot box, you know, in three years, in six years. Okay. Um, so, but you know, these forces that were so um, obsessed, I guess you could say. I mean, I mean, they, um, you know, as I say, this was. This was very much a, a um, you know, a conflict, a class conflict. Um, Washington was just uh, obsessed with getting rid of this regime, um, and those groups inside Chile that were willing to collaborate in pursuit of this objective were, were equally kind of just, um, uh, uh, you know, obsessed. You could say. I mean, I mean, there was there was no there was no. I mean. Let me, let me sort of let me let me answer somewhat differently. Um, the, the Allende government had a surprisingly strong political mandate. If you compare Allende's uh, the Allende government with the Frey government, now the when Allende comes into office in 1970, he wins by just over 36 percent of the popular vote. Of the, uh, wins with a plurality of the popular vote, 36 plus percent, which was normal in Chilean uh, political history. There was only one, only one occasion in Chilean political history where a presidential candidate got more than uh, half of the popular vote, and that was Eduardo Frey in uh, 1964. But by 19, in the, in the midterm congressional elections in 1973, the UP vote is up to 44%. Now, um, so in a way, you could almost say that an effective case could almost be made by, for saying that the military coup occurs not because the government is losing electoral support, but precisely because its support was growing. Moreover, there was no, um, what can you say, there was no, um, uh, I mean, it can't be inferred that all, everyone who voted for the Christian Democrats, for example, supported the military coup. Because for most of 1973, there was a lot of negotiations going on between the Christian Democrats and the government to see if they could reach some kind of modus vivendi. Um, and in fact, it's very interesting to, in, in fact, that that um, the jump from 36% in 1970 to 44% in 1973 was, I think, the the first time in Chilean electoral history where a government had actually increased its vote during its term in office. If you go back and look at the Frey period. Frey gets elected with 56%. The midterm congressional elections in 1967, the Christian Democrats are down to 33%. So, um, you know, so I think it's, um, you know, it doesn't really answer the question of why. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I mean, you know, I think that, that, you know, one can underestimate the, the um, one, one can overstate the extent to which, um, you know, uh, the majority of, of Chileans indeed wanted Allende to be toppled. Yeah, well, I mean, you make an important point that it wasn't just long-term, large-scale, you know, um, programs that were implemented, but also a whole series of short, shorter-term impact-type programs to consolidate and expand the government's support. As, you know, like you were saying, you know, a litre of milk for all school children, um, a whole series of, of, um, of really concrete programs that, that did improve, you know, that, that contributed to improving, the, you know, the lot of the, um, you know, of their, of their you know, social base, of their constituency. I mean, the violence perpetrated, and I mean, by, by, even by the standards of Latin American military coups, this was a particularly violent and brutal coup. And I think that, it, but it wasn't so much the violence of sort of, you know, an, you know, anomic violence by sort of, you know, psychopathic generals. I mean, or, you know, psychopaths. I mean, maybe there are a few among them. But I think the violence served, was designed to serve very specific political and economic purposes. Um, and I, I think it was designed to 
uh, cower and um, uh, atomize, uh, you know, a very a highly class, you know, politically conscious working class. And as part of an effort to recreate the optimal conditions for the kind of economic model that Washington, that, 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 that Pinochet was intent on implementing. And so he wanted a sort of a disciplined and docile labor force. So I think the violence had, had you know, had, had very specific, you know, political and economic objectives. It wasn't just, it wasn't just violence carried out for the sake of violence, although, you know, some, some of it may well have been. The civilian control of the military doesn't, is, doesn't have deep roots through, through most of the third world. In other words, third world military institutions in Latin America and elsewhere, and you can see this in Asia, have always seen, have primarily seen themselves not just as guardians of national patrimony, but as political actors. Okay? Now, uh, as, so, you know, in that sense, you know, they've always seen themselves as political actors. You know, in, 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 a, as in the last resort, they'll intervene to save the country from chaos or from, you know, dismemberment. But regarding the, uh, the Chilean um, military, um, the October strike, 1972 strike, of the, uh, the big strike of the capitalist class, and it essentially comes to an end when Allende was able to convince the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, General Prats, and two of his army generals to come into the cabinet. Okay? I, mean, the, I mean, up until that point, the, you know, the armed forces were, you know, they saw themselves as uh, very hierarchical institutions, but basically they saw themselves as, as um, you know, talk about being non-political actors. But in any event, he brings General Prats and two leading army generals into the um, cabinet. Now, this is at a time when there's a lot of coup activity going on, particularly within the Navy and the Air Force. The problem for that Navy and the Air Force was that no coup was going to succeed without the army. Right. Now, General Prats, his idea in coming, uh, and it, when, when, when at the end they brought General Prats and the army generals into the cabinet, it really discombobulated the, um, the coup plotters in the Navy and the Army, uh, in the Air Force, because they just, they thought this was, they couldn't believe it. But General Prats' idea was he would <coughs> stay in the cabinet until the congressional elections were held in 1973 at which point you'd get some clear idea of how much support there was for the government. But what happened in those elections was the government got 44%, the combined opposition parties got 56%, so essentially it was still a political deadlock. At that point, um, the Navy and the Air Force, the golpistas, are getting uh, antsy and they want to do something. Um, and also a number of army uh, officers within the army are also moving toward, you know, sympathetic towards um, supporting a coup. However, there was, the problem was General Prats, how to get rid of him. And because the army is a very hierarchical, disciplined organisation, very difficult to conduct, you know, for political divisions, debate and, and so on to take, to take, um, to, you know, to, to sort of take hold. Now, um, and of course, General Prats, you know, commanded a lot of respect amongst the troops. And in fact, he'd been involved in putting down a premature coup attempt in June of 1973. So, in any event, once the, um, in the aftermath of the congressional elections, the Navy and the Air Force, you know, decide they're, they're going to they're going to make a coup. Okay. So, what follows is a very concerted effort by, you know, within the armed forces and also within civil society to try and pressure Prats to resign, to get him out of the cabinet and to get him to resign. Um, and there was a huge pressure on him, you know. Um, you've got continuing calls within, within um, uh, uh, civilian calls for a coup. The major, the biggest um, you know, circulation newspaper in Chile, um, El Mercurio, was calling was talking about all you know the benefits of a, a military takeover, and eventually, General Prats and of course, the army you know you, you, the sectors of the army are beginning are moving toward uh, 
aligning themselves with the coup plotters. And ultimately, General Pratt succumbs to these pressures, offers his resignation, because, and primarily because he didn't want to see the army split. And so, at that point, the coup plotting swings into sort of, you know, top gear, um, the Navy takes the initiative, and, and, and the thing sort of snowballs. But, um, but you know, but, um, so that basically was the, uh, in terms of the significant role of the army in all of this around this period, I think that's, that basically was a sort of important aspect. But, but uh, and I mean, at the very beginning, you know, you had other constitutionalist generals. Uh, one was assassinated in a failed, uh, in, in um, General René Schneider was assassinated in the period between the end of his election and inauguration by a, in, there was a failed coup attempt by a, a renegade right-wing general, and he was assassinated. Um, so, but at the beginning, you know, the constitutionalist generals were pretty much, you know, in charge of the armed forces. But slowly but surely, uh, they uh, disappeared, eliminated, and you know, forced to resign. And uh, so that's what happened. There was yes, there was a certain kind of collaboration during the latter part of the, uh, the second half of the 1970s. <clears throat> This was a, a, um, a scheme called Operation Condor. And oh, sorry, but before that, because that was, that was after the coup. Yeah, so yeah. Before, that, before the coup. The, the um, that happened in the 60s. And there was, yeah. Um, that, um, during, the, I mean, during the Allende period itself. Um, I think there was some involvement, I'm not sure, uh, my recollection is there might have been some involvement by the Brazilians. Um, but I don't, I don't precisely remember. But there was. But, the, but in a way, the more interesting kind of aspect was this Operation Condor, which was organised by the militaries of, you know, Argentina, um, you know, Vidala and Pinochet. And it involved, um, it initially involved going around, um, you know, the continent, you know, knocking off high-profile opponents of these regimes who were trying to mobilise opposition to them. And Chile was the ringleader. I mean, Pinochet was the ringleader of this. And, he, and, and Pinochet um, internationalised this, this whole project. So he was sending DINA agents around the world to, um, to assassinate high-profile Chilean exiles who were attempting to mobilise you know, governments to oppose the regime. For example, Orlando Letelier in the United States. Um, and and, um, there were, and uh, I think General... General Pratt, not General Pratt, General, General, sorry? General Pratt, yeah, in Mexico. And then Bernardo Leighton and his wife, who were Christian Democrats in Italy, they were both seriously injured. So he was sending, the, he was sending his security force around to try and you know, knock these people off. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, this, was a, um, this was a particularly brutal uh, regime. And, um, uh, you know, but, um, and well, interestingly enough, too, just end on this point. Um, up, up until, you know, the, the middle of the Reagan administration, when there's a, a decision by the Reagan administration to try and sort of broker a uh, return to democracy, all of the American administrations up to that point basically never really pressured, put any pressure on Pinochet to re-democratise, and that included the, the Carter administration. The Carter administration took a very tough line on Chile in regard to human rights individual rights, human rights, you know, but, but pushing to sort of re-democratise was way down that order. It was, you know, you, you'd hear it mentioned occasionally, but basically it wasn't a big issue for them. They're primarily focused, so this issue of, of, of re-democratisation in Chile is something that comes very late in the game and, um, uh, and, uh, and for reasons having to do, I might add, with, with American interests, uh, a decision on the part of the Reagan administration, which had initially come into office offering the close embrace, decision that, um, that perhaps you know, America's uh, interests at a certain point might be best served if the army went back into the barracks. You know. um, yeah, well, I mean, obviously it's had a significant influence. If you think about the fact that during the whole Cold War era, about, about 500,000 Latin American military officers were trained in, these, in places like the School of the Americas and other US military institutions. And they didn't just get training in sort of military expertise, but they also, uh, there was also kind of ideological training. In other words, uh, they were socialised into the kind of belief systems and values of, you know, the American system, you know, 
support for private property, anti-communism, um, opposition to large-scale social and economic change. So, th so these kinds of values were inculcated or, or, or deepened, if you like. And so, and, so you, and, and so you get a situation where, as in Chile, um, a military is willing to subordinate its national commitments to collaborate with a foreign government in toppling a regime of which both disapprove. Question. You've talked about yeah. the two possible strategies yeah. for Unidad Popular. Mm. Essentially make more concessions mm. and try to mm. reach out to the right of politics. Yeah. Yeah. Make no concessions mm -hmm. and yeah. arm or mobilise yeah. on a yeah. military yeah. basis even mm. the other forces. Which do you think was right? Or was there any possible way through? I'm not sure that either. I mean, it's yeah, that's a really that's a really difficult question. I I don't think at that point that the um, opposition was willing to you know, that that those that wanted the top of the end day were interested in any kind of negotiation whatsoever. And I mean, I think the I mean, you know, when all was said and done, um, there was a government that you know a government that comes to power through the ballot box. And those kind of it, it, you know, I mean, the other side had a monopoly of a coercive power. In the beginning, and that made it extremely difficult. Um, and that's why the interesting, con there's a very interesting, con I'll just end on this point if I can. The very interesting contrast is, is with Chile on the one hand and Cuba and Nicaragua on the other. Now, the big advantage that the, Chile, the Nicaraguans and the Cubans had was that they came to power through revolutions, which swept away the old order. The, 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 um, the, the, the state institutions, the political parties, and particularly the, you know, the military disintegrated, and so the new armed forces of the Cuban and Nicaraguan state become the guerrillas. Okay? Now, um, and, what the, and, and in the course of that happening, the United States lost all of its entree into these societies. You know, it had been plugged into the political parties, to the employer organisations, the military, all that swept away. So they had enormous advantage, and that's why they found it so difficult to topple those two regimes because they never had the support inside. I mean, in Cuba, they didn't have it. And in Nicaragua, Reagan attempted for eight years to get rid of this regime. And finally, it was only through electoral intervention, precisely because they never had that any significant social support inside those countries that were willing to sort of collaborate with, with, um, you know, with, with, with the American government that wanted to get rid of those two regimes. It's a nice kind of contrast there. And that's why, you know, Chile it only took three years. In um, Nicaragua, it took, what, a, a decade? And in Cuba, it's, you know, you know, it's endless. We are about to move into the phase of nibbles and drinks and listening to Victor Hara music. But before okay. we do, please thank Morris Morley once please. again. Aprendimos a quererte desde la historia pura, con un verso de tu bravura. Le puso cerco la muerte y aquí se queda la clara, la entraña de transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Mano gloriosa y fuerte sobre la historia dispara cuando toda Santa Clara se despierta para verte ¡Ay! y aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comandante Che Guevara se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia 
Tienes quemando la brisa con sones de primavera para plantar la bandera con la luz de tu sonrisa y aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comandante Che Guevara que conduce a nueva empresa donde espera la firmeza de tu brazo libertario y aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comandante Che Guevara de tu querida presencia comandante Che Guevara seguiremos adelante como junto a ti seguimos y con Fidel te decimos hasta siempre comandante y aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Y aquí se queda la clara, la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Y aquí se queda la clara. La entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Más, Juan. Y aquí se queda la clara, la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante Che Guevara. Oh,